variable, and therefore miserable condition of man. This minute I was well, and am ill this minute. I am surprised with a sudden change and alteration to worse, and can impute it to no cause, nor call it by any name. We study health, and we deliberate upon our meats, and drink, and air, and exercises, and we hew and we polish every stone that goes to that building. And so our health is a long and a regular work. But in a minute, a cannon batters all, overthrows all, demolishes all. A sickness unprevented for all our diligence, unsuspected for all our curiosity, nay, undeserved if we consider only disorder, summons us, seizes us, possesses us, destroys us in an instant. O oh, miserable condition of man, which was not imprinted by God, who as he is immortal himself, had put a coal, a beam of immortality into us, which he might have blown into a flame, but blew it out by our first sin. We beggared ourselves by hearkening after false riches, and infatuated ourselves by hearkening after false knowledge. So that now we do not only die, but die upon the rack, die by the torment of sickness. Nor that only, but are pre-afflicted, super-afflicted with these jealousies and suspicions and apprehensions of sickness before we can call it a sickness. We are not sure we are ill. One hand asks the other by the pulse, and our eye asks our urine how we do. Oh, multiplied misery, we die and cannot enjoy death. Because we die in this torment of sickness, we are tormented with sickness and cannot stay till the torment come. But pre-apprehensions and presages prophesy those torments which induce that death before either come. And our dissolution is conceived in these first changes, quickened in the sickness itself, and born in death which bears date from these first changes. Is this the honor which man hath by being a little world? That he hath these earthquakes in himself, sudden shakings, these lightnings, sudden flashes, these thunders, sudden noises, these eclipses, sudden obfuscations and darkness of his senses, these blazing stars, sudden fiery exhalations, these rivers of blood, sudden red waters. Is he a world to himself only therefore, that he hath enough in himself, not only to destroy and execute himself, but to presage that execution upon himself, to assist the sickness, to antedate the sickness, to make the sickness the more irremediable by sad apprehensions, and as if he would make a fire the more vehement by sprinkling water upon the coals, so to wrap a hot fever in cold melancholy, lest the fever alone should not destroy fast enough without this contribution, nor perfect the work which is destruction, except we joined an artificial sickness of our own melancholy to our natural, our unnatural fever. O oh, perplexed discomposition, O oh, riddling distemper, O oh, miserable condition of man, I observe the physician with the same diligence as he the disease. I see he fears. I overtake him. I overrun him in his fear. And I go the faster because he makes his pace slow. I fear the more because he disguises his fear. And I see it with the more sharpness because he would not have me see it. He knows that his fear shall not disorder the practice and exercise of his art. But he knows that my fear may disorder the effect and working of his practice. As the ill affections of the spleen complicate and mingle themselves with every infirmity of the body, so doth fear insinuate itself in every action or passion of the mind. And as the wind in the body will counterfeit any disease and seem the stone and seem the gout, so fear will counterfeit any disease of the mind. It shall seem love, a love of having. And it is but a fear, a jealous and suspicious fear of losing. It shall seem valor and despising, an undervaluing danger. And it is but fear in an overvaluing of opinion and estimation and a fear of losing that. A man that is not afraid of a lion is afraid of a cat. 
He was afraid of some joint of meat at the table presented to feed him. Not afraid of the sound of drums and trumpets and shot and those which they seek to drown the last cries of men and is afraid of some particular harmonious instrument. So much afraid as that with any of these the enemy might drive this man, otherwise valiant enough, out of the field. I know not what fear is, no, I know not what it is that I fear now. I fear not the hastening of my death, and yet I do fear the increase of the disease. I should belie nature if I should deny that I fear this. And if I should say that I fear death, I should belie God. My weakness is from nature, who hath but her measure. My strength is from God, who possesses and distributes infinitely. As then every cold air is not a damp, every shivering is not a stupefaction, so every fear is not a fearfulness, every declination is not a running away, every debating is not a resolving, every wish that it were not thus is not a murmuring nor a dejection, though it be thus. But as my physician's fear puts not him from his practice, neither doth mine put me from receiving from God and man and myself spiritual and civil and moral assistances and consolations. From the bells of the church adjoining, I am daily remembered of my burial in the funerals of others. We have a convenient author who writ a discourse of bells when he was prisoner in Turkey. How would he have enlarged himself if he had been my fellow prisoner in this sick bed, so near to that steeple, which never ceases, no more than the harmony of the spheres, but is more heard? When the Turks took Constantinople, they melted the bells into ordnance. I have heard both bells and ordnance, but never been so much affected with those as with these bells. I have lain near a steeple in which there are said to be more than 30 bells, and near another where there is one so big as that the clapper is said to weigh more than 600 pounds, yet never so affected as here. Here the bells can scarce solemnize the funeral of any person but that I knew him, or knew that he was my neighbor. We dwelt in houses near to one another before, but now he has gone into that house into which I must follow him. There is a way of correcting the children of great persons that other children are corrected in their behalf and in their names, and this works upon them who indeed had more deserved it. And when these bells tell me that now one and now another is buried, must not I acknowledge that they have the correction due to me and paid the debt that I owe? There is a story of a bell in a monastery, which when any of the house was sick to death, rang always voluntarily, and they knew the inevitableness of the danger by that. It rung once when no man was sick, but the next day one of the house fell from the steeple and died, and the bell held the reputation of a prophet still. If these bells that warn to a funeral now were appropriated to none, may not I, by the hour of a funeral, supply? How many men that stand at an execution, if they would ask for what dies that man, should hear their own faults condemned and see themselves executed by attorney? We scarce hear of any man preferred, but we think of ourselves that we might very well have been that man. Why might not I have been that man? that is carried to his grave now. Could I fit myself to stand or sit in any man's place and not to lie in any man's grave? I may lack much of the good parts of the meanest, but I lack nothing of the mortality of the weakest. They may have acquired better abilities than I, but I was born to as many infirmities as they. To be an incumbent by lying down in a grave, to be a doctor by teaching mortification by example, by dying, 
Though I may have seniors, others may be older than I, yet I have proceeded apace in a good university and gone a great way in a little time by the furtherance of a vehement fever. And whomsoever these bells bring to the ground today, if he and I had been compared yesterday, perchance I should have been thought likelier to come to this preferment then than he. God hath kept the power of death in his own hands, lest any man should bribe death. If man knew the gain of death, the ease of death, he would solicit, he would provoke death to assist him by any hand which he might use. But as when men see many of their own professions preferred, it ministers a hope that that may light upon them. So when these hourly bells tell me of so many funerals of men like me, it presents, if not a desire that it may, yet a comfort whensoever mine shall come. Now this bell tolling softly for another says to me, thou must die. Perchance he for whom this bell tolls may be so ill as that he knows not it tolls for him. And perchance I may think myself so much better than I am, as that they who are about me and see my state may have caused it a toll for me, and I know not that. The Church is Catholic, universal, so are all her actions. All that she does belongs to all. He baptizes a child. That action concerns me, for that child is thereby connected to that head, which is my head too, and engraft into that body whereof I am a member. And when she buries a man, that action concerns me. All mankind is of one author and is one volume. When one man dies, one chapter is not torn out of the book, but translated into a better language. And every chapter must be so translated. God employs several translators. Some pieces are translated by age, some by sickness, some by war, some by justice. But God's hand is in every translation and his hand shall bind up all our scattered leaves again for that library where every book shall lie open to one another. As therefore the bell that rings to a sermon calls not upon the preacher only but upon the congregation to come, so this bell calls us all. But how much more me who am brought so near the door by this sickness there was a contention as far as a suit in which both piety and dignity, religion and estimation were mingled, which of the religious orders should ring to prayers first in the morning. And it was determined that they should ring first that rose earliest. If we understand aright the dignity of this bell that tolls for our evening prayer, we would be glad to make it ours by rising early in that application that it might be ours as well as his, whose indeed it is. The bell doth toll for him that thinks it doth. And though it intermit again, yet from that minute that that occasion wrought upon him, he is united to God. Who casts not up his eye to the sun when it rises, but who takes off his eyes from a comet when that breaks out, who bends not his ear to any bell which upon any occasion rings, but who can remove it from that bell which is passing a piece of himself out of this world? No man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. If a clod be washed away by the sea, Europe is the less as well as if a promontory were, as well as if a manner of thy friends or of thine own were. Any man's death diminishes me because I am involved in mankind and therefore never send to know for whom the bell tolls.
it tolls for thee. Neither can we call this a begging of misery or a borrowing of misery, as though we were not miserable enough of ourselves, but must fetch in more from the next house in taking upon us the misery of our neighbors. Truly it were an excusable covetousness if we did, for affliction is a treasure, and scarce any man hath enough of it. No man hath affliction enough that is not matured and ripened by it, and made fit for God by that affliction. If a man carry treasure in bullion or in a wedge of gold, and have none coined into current monies, his treasure will not defray him as he travels. Tribulation is treasure in the nature of it, but it is not current money in the use of it except we get nearer and nearer our home, heaven, by it. Another man may be sick too, and sick to death, and this affliction may lie in his bowels as gold in a mine, and be of no use to him. But this bell that tells me of his affliction digs out and applies that gold to me, if by this consideration of another's danger I take mine own into contemplation and so secure myself by making my recourse to my God, who is our only security. The bell rings out and tells me in him that I am dead. The bell rings out, the pulse thereof is changed. The tolling was a faint and intermitting pulse upon one side. This stronger and argues more and better life. His soul is gone out, and as a man who had a lease of a thousand years after the expiration of a short one, or an inheritance after the life of a man in a consumption, he is now entered into the possession of his better estate. His soul is gone with her. Who saw it come in, or who saw it go out? Nobody. Yet everybody is sure he had one, and hath none. If I will ask mere philosophers what the soul is, I shall find amongst them that will tell me it is nothing but the temperament and harmony, and just an equal composition of the elements in the body which produces all those faculties which we ascribe to the soul. And so, in itself is nothing, no separable substance that overlives the body. They see the soul is nothing else in other creatures, and they affect an impious humility to think as low of man. But if my soul were no more than the soul of a beast, I could not think so. That soul that can reflect upon itself, consider itself, is more than so. St. Augustine studied the nature of the soul as much as anything but the salvation of the soul. And he sent an express messenger to St. Jerome to consult of some things concerning the soul. But he satisfies himself with this. Let the departure of my soul to salvation be evident to my faith and I care the less how dark the entrance of my soul into my body be to my reason. It is the going out more than the coming in that concerns us. This soul, this bell tells me, is gone out whither. Who shall tell me that? I know not who it is, much less what he was. The condition of the man and the course of his life, which would tell me whether he is gone, I know not. I was not there in his sickness, nor at his death. I saw not his way, nor his end, nor can ask them who did, thereby to conclude or argue whether he is gone. But yet I have one nearer me than all these, mine own charity. I ask that, and that tells me he has gone to everlasting rest and joy and glory. 
I owe him a good opinion. It is but thankful charity in me because I received benefit and instruction from him when his bell tolled. And I, being made the fitter to pray by that disposition, wherein I was assisted by his occasion, did pray for him. And I pray not without faith. So I do charitably. So I do faithfully believe that that soul is gone to everlasting rest and joy and glory. But for the body, how poor a wretched thing is that? We cannot express it so fast as it grows worse and worse. That body, which scarce three minutes since was such a house as that that soul, which made but one step from thence to heaven, was scarce thoroughly content to leave that for heaven. That body has lost the name of a dwelling house because none dwells in it and is making haste to lose the name of a body and dissolve to putrefaction. Who would not be affected to see a clear and sweet river in the morning grow a kennel of muddy land water by noon and condemned to the saltness of the sea by night? And how lame a picture how faint a representation is that of the precipitation of man's body to dissolution. Now all the parts built up and knit by a lovely soul, now but a statue of clay, and now these limbs melted off as if that clay were but snow. And now the whole house is but a handful of sand, so much dust, and but a peck of rubbish, so much bone. If he who, as this bell tells me, is gone now, were some excellent artificer. Who comes to him for a clock, or for a garment now, or for counsel if he were a lawyer, if a magistrate, for justice? Man, before he hath his immortal soul, hath a soul of sense, and a soul of vegetation before that. This immortal soul did not forbid other souls to be in us before, but when this soul departs, it carries all with it. No more vegetation, no more sense. Such a mother-in-law is the earth in respect of our natural mother. In her womb we grew, and when she was delivered of us, we were planted in some place, in some calling in the world. In the womb of the earth we diminish, and when she is delivered of us, our grave opens for another. We are not transplanted, but transported. Our dust blown away with profane dust, with every wind. It is not enough to hear sermons it is not enough to live a moral, honest life, but take it in the midst, and that extends to all. For there is no believing without hearing, nor working without believing. Be pleased to consider this great work of believing in the matter of what it was that was to be believed, that that Jesus, whose age they knew, must be antedated so far as that they must believe him to be elder than Abraham that that Jesus, whose father and mother and brothers and sisters they knew must be believed to be of another family and to have a father in another place, and yet he to be as old as his father, and to have another proceeding from him, and yet he to be no older than that person who proceeded from him, that that Jesus, whom they knew to be that carpenter's son and knew his work, must be believed to have set up a frame that reached to heaven out of which no man could, and in which any man might be saved. Was it not as easy to believe that those tears which they saw upon his cheeks were pearls, that those drops of blood which they saw upon his back were rubies, that that spittle which they saw upon his face was enamel, that those hands which they saw buffet him were reached out to place him in a throne, and that that voice which they heard cry, Crucifige, crucify him, was a vivat rex, long live Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And to believe that from that man, 
that worm, and no man ingloriously produced as a conjurer, ingloriously apprehended as a thief, ingloriously executed as a traitor, they should look for glory, and all glory, and everlasting glory. And from that melancholic man who was never seen to laugh in all his life, and whose soul was heavy unto death, they should look for joy, and all joy, and everlasting joy, and for salvation, and everlasting salvation from him who could not save himself from the ignominy, from the torment, from the death of the cross. We are all conceived in close prison. In our mother's wombs, we are close prisoners all. When we are born, we are born but to the liberty of the house. Prisoners still, though within larger walls. And then all our life is but a going out to the place of execution, to death. Now was there ever any man seen to sleep in the cart between Newgate and Tyburn? between the prison and the place of execution, does any man sleep? And we sleep all the way, from the womb to the grave, we are never thoroughly awake, but pass on with such dreams and imaginations as these. I may live as well as another, and why should I die rather than another? But awake and tell me, says this text, quis homo? Who is that other that thou talkst of? What man is he that liveth and shall not see death? When I look upon God as I am bid to do in this text, in those terrible judgments which he hath executed upon some men, and see that there is nothing between me and the same judgment, for I have sinned the same sins, and God is the same God. I am not able of myself to dye that grass, that spectacle through which I look upon this God in what color I will. Whether this glass shall be black through my despair, and so I shall see God in the cloud of my sins, or red in the blood of Jesus Christ, and I shall see God in a bath of the blood of his Son. Whether I shall see God as a dove with an olive branch, peace to my soul or as an eagle, a vulture to prey and to prey everlastingly upon me, whether in the deep floods of tribulations, spiritual or temporal, I shall see God as an ark to take me in, or as a whale to swallow me. And if his whale do swallow me, the tribulation devour me, whether his purpose be to restore me or to consume me, I, I of myself cannot tell. I cannot look upon God in what line I will, nor take hold of God by what handle I will. He is a terrible God, I take him so. And then I cannot discontinue, I cannot break off this terribleness and say, He hath been terrible to that man, and there is an end of his terror, it reaches not to me. Why not to me? In me there is no merit nor shadow of merit. In God there is no change, nor shadow of change. I am the same sinner, he is the same God. Still the same desperate sinner, still the same terrible God. Our God is not out of breath because he hath blown one tempest and swallowed a navy. Our God hath not burnt out his eyes because he hath looked upon a train of powder. In the light of heaven and in the darkness of hell he sees alike. He sees not only all machinations of hands when things come to action, but all imaginations of hearts when they are in their first consultations. 
future distinguished not his quando, all is one time to him. Mountains and valleys, sea and land distinguish not his ubi, all is one place to him. When I begin, says God to Eli, I will make an end. Not only that all God's purposes shall have their certain end, but that even then, when he begins, he makes an end. From the very beginning imprints an infallible assurance that whom he loves, he loves to the end. As a circle is printed all at once, so his beginning and ending is all one. When we consider with a religious seriousness the manifold weaknesses of the strongest devotions in time of prayer, it is a sad consideration. I throw myself down in my chamber and I call in and invite God and his angels thither. And when they are there, I neglect God and his angels for the noise of a fly, for the rattling of a coach, for the whining of a door. I talk on in the same posture of praying, eyes lifted up, knees bowed down, as though I prayed to God. And if God or his angel should ask me when I thought last of God in that prayer, I cannot tell. Sometimes I find that I had forgot what I was about, but when I began to forget it, I cannot tell. A memory of yesterday's pleasures, a fear of tomorrow's dangers, a straw under my knee, a noise in my ear, a light in mine eye, and anything, a nothing, a fancy, a chimera in my brain, troubles me in my prayer. So certainly is there nothing, nothing in spiritual things, perfect in this world. that God should let my soul fall out of his hand into a bottomless pit and roll an unremovable stone upon it and leave it to that which it finds there and it shall find that there which it never imagined till it came thither and never think more of that soul, never have more to do with it. That of that providence of God that studies the life of every weed and worm and ant and spider and toad and viper, there should never, never any beam flow out upon me. That that God who looked upon me when I was nothing and called me when I was not as though I had been, out of the womb and depth of darkness, will not look upon me now, when though a miserable and a banished and a damned creature Yet I am his creature still, and contribute something to his glory, even in my damnation. That that God who hath often looked upon me in my foulest uncleanness, and when I had shut out the eye of the day, the sun, and the eye of the night, the taper, and the eyes of all the world with curtains and windows and doors, did yet see me and see me in mercy by making me see that he saw me, and sometimes brought me to a present remorse and for that time to a forbearing of that sin, should so turn himself from me to his glorious saints and angels as that no saint nor angel, nor Christ Jesus himself should ever pray him to look towards me, never remember him, that such a soul there is. That that God who hath so often said to my soul, Quare morieris, why wilt thou die? and so often sworn to my soul, leave it dominus, as the Lord liveth, I would not have thee die, but live. Will neither let me die, nor let me live, but die an everlasting life, and live an everlasting death, that that God, who when he could not get into me by standing and knocking by his ordinary means of entering, by his word, his, his judgments, and hath shaked the house, this body, with age, and set this house on fire with fevers and calentures, and frighted the master of the house, my soul, with horrors and heavy apprehensions, and so made an entrance into me. 
that that God should frustrate all his own purposes and practices upon me and leave me and cast me away as though I... This God at last should let this soul go away as a smoke, as a vapor, as a bubble, and that then this soul cannot be a smoke, a vapor, nor a bubble, but must lie in darkness as long as the Lord of light is light itself and never a spark of that light reach to my soul. What brimstone is not amber? What gnashing is not a comfort? What gnawing of the worm is not a tickling? What torment is not a marriage bed to this damnation? To be secluded eternally, eternally, eternally from the sight of God. Especially to us. For as the perpetual loss of that is most heavy with which we have been best acquainted and to which we have been most accustomed, so shall this damnation, which consists in the loss of the sight and presence of God, be heavier to us than others, because God hath so graciously and so erasely appeared to us in his pillar of fire, in the light of prosperity, and in the pillar of the cloud, in hiding himself for a while from us, we that have seen him in all the parts of this commission, in his word, in his sacraments, and in good example, and not believed, shall be further removed from his sight in the next world than they to whom he never appeared in this. But to him that believes aright and overcomes all temptations to a wrong belief, God shall give the accomplishment of fullness and fullness of joy and joy rooted in glory, and glory established in eternity, and this eternity is God. To him that believes and overcomes, God shall give himself in an everlasting presence and fruition. Amen. Alas, they, we, men of this world, Worms of this dunghill, whether basilisks or blind worms, whether scarabs or silkworms, whether high or low in the world, have no minds to change. Men and women call one another inconstant and accuse one another of having changed their minds, when, God knows, they have but changed the object of their eye and seen a better white or red. An old man loves not the same spirit that he did when he was young, nor a sick man the same meats that he did when he was well. But these men have not changed their minds. The old man hath changed his fancy, and the sick man his taste, neither his mind. Poor, intricated soul, riddling, perplexed, labyrinthical soul, Thou couldst not say that thou believest not in God if there were no God. Thou couldst not believe in God if there were no God. If there were no God, thou couldst not speak, thou couldst not think, not a word, not a thought, no, not against God. Thou couldst not blaspheme the name of God, thou couldst not swear if there were no God. For all thy faculties, however depraved and perverted by thee, are from him. And except thou canst seriously believe that thou art nothing, thou canst not believe that there is no God. If I should that had drawn blood, lie weltering and surrounding in his own blood, is there a God now? If thou couldst answer me, no, these are but inventions and representations of men, and I believe a God never the more for this. If I should ask thee at a sermon, where thou shouldst hear the judgments of God formally denounced and executed, re-denounced and applied to present occasions, is there a God now? If thou couldst answer me, no, these are but inventions of state to supple and regulate congregations and keep people in order, and I believe a God never the more for this. Be as confident as thou canst in company, for company is the atheist's sanctuary. I respite thee not till the day of judgment, when I may see thee upon thy knees, upon thy face, begging of the hills that they would fall down and cover thee from the fierce wrath of God, to ask thee then, is there a God now? I respite thee not till the day of thine own death, 
when thou shalt have evidence enough that there is a God, though no other evidence but to find a devil, and evidence enough that there is a heaven, though no other evidence but to feel hell. To ask thee then, is there a God now? I respite thee but a few hours, but six hours, but till midnight. Wake then, and then, dark and alone, remember that I ask thee now, is there a God? And if thou darest, say no. The Lord then, the Son of God, had a sitio in heaven as well as upon the cross. He thirsted our salvation there, and in the midst of the fellowship of the Father from whom he came, and of the Holy Ghost who came from him and the Father, and all the angels who came by a lower way from them all, he desired the conversation of man for man's sake. He that was God the Lord became Christ a man, and he that was Christ became Jesus, no man, a dead man, to save man. To save man always in all his parts, and to save all men in all parts of the world. To save his soul from hell where we should have felt pains and yet been dead then when we felt them. And seen horrid spectacles and yet been in darkness and blindness then when we saw them. And suffer unsufferable torments and yet have told over innumerable ages in suffering them. To save this soul from that hell and to fill that capacity which it hath and give it a capacity which it hath not to comprehend the joys and glory of heaven this Christ became Jesus. To save this body from the condemnation of everlasting corruption, where the worms that we breed are our betters because they have a life. Where the dust of dead kings is blown into the street, and the dust of the street blown into the river, and the muddy river tumbled into the sea, and the sea remanded into all the veins and channels of the earth. To save this body from everlasting dissolution, dispersion, dissipation, and to make it into a glorious resurrection. Not only a temple of the Holy Ghost, but a companion of the Holy Ghost in the kingdom of heaven. This Christ became this Jesus. To save this man, body and soul together, from the punishments due to his former sins, and to save him from falling into future sins by the assistance of his word preached and his sacraments administered in the church, which he purchased by his blood, is this person, the Lord, the Christ, become this Jesus, this Savior. To save so always in soul, in body, in both, and also to save all men. For to exclude others from that kingdom is a tyranny and usurpation and to exclude thyself as a sinful and a rebellious melancholy. But as melancholy in the body is the hardest humor to be purged, so is the melancholy in the soul the distrust of thy salvation too. Flashes of presumption a calamity will quench, but clouds of desperation calamities thicken upon us. But even in this inordinate dejection, Thou exaltest thyself above God, and makest thy worst better than his best, thy sins larger than his mercy. The whole frame of the world is the theater, and every creature, the stage, the medium, the glass in which we may see God. Moses made the lava in the tabernacle of the looking glasses of women. Scarce can you imagine a vainer thing, except you will accept the vain lookers on in that action, than the looking glasses of women. And yet Moses brought the looking glasses of women to a religious use to show them that came in the spots of dirt which they had taken by the way that they might wash themselves clean before they passed any farther. There is not so poor a creature, but may be thy glass to see God in. The greatest flat glass that can be made cannot represent anything greater than it is. If every gnat that flies were an archangel, all that could but tell me that there is a God, and the poorest worm that creeps tells me that. If I should ask the basilisk, 
How camest thou by those killing eyes, he would tell me. Thy God made me so. And if I should ask the slow worm, how camest thou to be without eyes, he would tell me. Thy God made me so. The cedar is no better a glass to see God in than the hyssop upon the wall. All things that are are equally removed from being nothing. And whatsoever hath any being is by that very being a glass in which we see God, who is the root and the fountain of all being. The whole frame of nature is the theater. The whole volume of creatures is the glass. And the light of nature, reason, is our light, which is another circumstance. He that will die the Christ upon Good Friday must hear his own bell toll all Lent. He that will be partaker of his passion at last must conform himself to his discipline of prayer and fasting before. Is there any man that in his chamber hears a bell toll for another man and does not kneel down to pray for that dying man? And then when his charity breathes out upon another man, does he not also reflect upon himself and dispose himself as if he were in the state of that dying man? We begin to hear Christ's bell toll now, and is not our bell in the chime? We must be in his grave before we come to his resurrection, and we must be in his deathbed before we come to his grave. We must do as he did, fast and pray, before we can say, as he said, into thy hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. You would not go into a medicinal bath without some preparatives. Presume not upon that bath, the blood of Christ Jesus in the sacrament then, without preparatives neither. Neither say to yourselves, we shall have preparatives enough, warnings enough, many more sermons before it come to that, and so it is too soon yet. You are not sure you shall have more, not sure you shall have all this, not sure you shall be affected with any. If you be when you are, remember that as in that good custom in these cities, you hear cheerful street music in the winter mornings. But yet there was a sad and doleful bellman that waked you and called upon you two or three hours before that music came. So for all that blessed music which the servants of God shall present to you in this place, it may be of use that a poor bellman waked you before, and though but by his noise, prepared you for their music. I have seen minute glasses, glasses so short-lived. If I were to preach upon this text to such a glass, it were enough for half the sermon, enough to show the worldly man his treasure and the object of his heart for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. To call his eye to that minute glass and to tell him, there flows, there flies your treasure and your heart with it. But if I had a secular glass, a glass that would run an age, if the two hemispheres of the world were composed in the form of such a glass, and all the world calcined and burnt to ashes, and all the ashes and sands and atoms of the world put into that glass, it would not be enough to tell the godly man what his treasure and the object of his heart is. A parrot or a stair, docile birds and our pregnant imitation will sooner be brought to relate to us the wisdom of a council table than any Ambrose or any Chrysostom, men that have gold and honey in their names, shall tell us what the sweetness, what the treasure of heaven is, and what that man's peace that hath set his heart upon that treasure. Doth not man die even in his birth? 
The breaking of prison is death, and what is our birth but a breaking of prison? As soon as we were clothed by God, our very apparel was an emblem of death. In the skins of dead beasts, he covered the skins of dying men. As soon as God set us on work, our very occupation was an emblem of death. It was to dig the earth, not to dig pitfalls for other men, but graves for ourselves. It comes equally to us all and makes us all equal when it comes. The ashes of an oak in the chimney are no epitaph of that oak to tell me how high or how large that was. It tells me not what flocks it sheltered while it stood, nor what men it hurt when it fell. The dust of great persons' graves is speechless too. It says nothing, it distinguishes nothing. As soon the dust of a wretch whom thou wouldest not, as of a prince whom thou couldest not look upon, will trouble thine eyes if the wind blow it thither. And when a whirlwind has blown the dust of the churchyard into the church, and the man sweeps out the dust of the church into the churchyard, who will undertake to sift those dusts again and to pronounce, this is the patrician, this is the noble flower, and this the yeomanly, this the plebeian brand. O oh, eternal and most glorious God, who sometimes in thy justice dost give the dead bodies of the saints to be meat unto the fowls of the heaven, and the flesh of thy saints unto the beasts of the earth, so that their blood is shed like water, and there is none to bury them, who sometimes sellst thy people for naught, and dost not increase thy wealth by their price, and yet never leavest us without that knowledge. That precious in thy sight is the death of thy saints. Death, seriously to consider the value, the price of a soul. It is precious, O Lord, because thine image is stamped and imprinted upon it. Precious because the blood of thy Son was paid for it. Precious because thy blessed Spirit, the Holy Ghost, works upon it and tries it. And precious because it is entered out of thy treasure. Suffer us not therefore, O Lord, so to undervalue ourselves, nay, so to impoverish thee, as to give away those souls, thy and precious souls, for nothing. And all the world is nothing, if the soul must be given for it. We know, O Lord, that our rent due to thee is our soul, and the day of our death is the day, and our deathbed the place where this rent is to be paid. And we know, too, that he that hath sold his soul before for unjust gain, or given away his soul before in the society and fellowship of sin, or lent away his soul for a time by a lukewarmness and temporizing to the dishonor of thy name, to the weakening of thy cause, to the discouraging of thy servants, he comes to that day and to that place, his death and deathbed, without any rent in his hand, without any soul to this purpose, to surrender it unto thee. Let therefore, O Lord, the same hand which is to receive them then, preserve these souls till then. Let that mouth that breathed them into us at first breathe always upon them whilst they are in us and suck them into itself when they depart from us. Preserve our souls, O Lord, because they belong to thee, and preserve our bodies because they belong to those souls. Thou alone dost steer our boat through all our voyage, but hast a more especial care of it, a more watchful eye upon it, when it comes to a narrow current or to a dangerous fall of waters. Thou hast a care of the preservation of those bodies in all the ways of our life. But in the straits of death, open thine eyes wider and enlarge thy providence towards us so far that no fever in the body may shake the soul, no apoplexy in the body damp or benumb the soul, nor any pain or agony of the body presage future torments to the soul. But so make thou our bed in all our sickness, 
that being used to thy hand, we may be content with any bed of thy making. Whether thou be pleased to change our feathers into flocks by withdrawing the conveniences of this life, or to change our flocks into dust, even the dust of the grave, by withdrawing us out of this life. And though thou divide man and wife, mother and child, friend and friend, by the hand of death, yet stay them that stay, and send them away that go with this consolation, that though we part at divers days and by divers ways here, yet we shall all meet at one place and at one day, a day that no night shall determine, the day of the glorious resurrection. <laughs>